Hi, my name is Craig Gilbert, and I am presenting a paper titled Theology and Lyrical Content and Its Implications for the Practicing Worship Leader. I apologize that I'm not there at the conference. I've had some medical history this, this uh, spring. I've had some difficulties, and I'm actually having surgery on Monday uh, tomorrow. And so when you get this video, I'll actually be, I'll actually be recovering from surgery. So I, I miss being there, but um, I hope that you will accept this uh, presentation um, in lieu of me actually uh, being on site. Um, for years, I've been leading worship from a lyrical focus. What I mean by this is that in selecting music for inclusion in congregational worship services, my choices are driven by two primary factors the lyrical content of the music and its relationship to the overall theme of the service, and the style or mood of the music fitting a particular part of the service or worship context. A little over a year ago, I became aware of Dr. Lester Ruth's study on the lyrical content of his selected groups of hymnody and Christian song. I was very interested in this study as I believed it had much to offer someone like myself who very carefully considers lyrical content for its theological message. Such analysis would most certainly provide much needed information to the worship leader choosing music for contemporary services since very little denominational guidance is available through national or even local channels. However, as I discussed this concept further with Dr. Ruth in his office, a disturbing question came into my mind. What if the lyrical content does not matter as much as we think it does because people are simply singing the songs without full understanding of the lyric or perhaps no real understanding at all? The beginning of this question come, came from a common and somewhat related issue usually found in popular music as a result of poor diction. The phenomenon is called a mondegrin. A recent commercial clearly demonstrates this term. I'm burning out this useless telephone. My hair is gone. All alone. Burning up the room with cheap cologne. The musty motor home. I'm the rocket man. Burning out his fuse up here alone. I told you it wasn't provolone. While not a straight comparison to whether singers in church fully understand the lyrics that they sing, the fact that this type of mishearing can occur in a song that listeners claim to enjoy, and in fact listen to hundreds of times, seemed compelling. The same listeners apparently never use contextual clues to tell them that the lyric they are singing could never be correct because their lyrical substitution makes no sense in relationship to the overall meaning of the song. This fact appears to lend credibility to the idea that congregations who sing a song only a handful of times and may not actually like or enjoy the songs they are singing could easily not be processing lyrical meaning at the level of the person who is selecting the song for use in worship, much less of the academics who study the music. If that is the case, then what would it mean for worship planners? There are so many academic studies on theology and music, music as theology, use of music in theology, the role of music in congregational music, and congregational worship, I, I, I rather, and the list goes on. As an academic interested in this subject, I have read many of the books and studies that you have heard referenced here today. However, as a practitioner, I notice a point that to me is a glaring insufficiency regarding this topic. Music's not used in a vacuum when it comes to worship. The singular similarity that I find in all of these published materials is that the questions being asked of and the facts being examined are of the music and or the text in question themselves. This completely disregards one of the focal points of congregational music, the congregation. If music is being asked to communicate theology and worship, how well is it actually being communicated to the congregation? If it is assumed that the singing congregation is engaged in a cognitive, the theological shaping activity while participating in the practice of making music and worship, shouldn't we be asking them to see if, in fact, any of this theology is actually shaping them the way we say it is? Much like in engineering, my widget may be a masterpiece of design and construction, but if it does not meet the need for which it was designed, what good does it do the average consumer? In practical reality, it makes no difference if the music in question is impeccable in construction, indisputable in content, and unassailable in focus. If the congregation participating in its realization does not comprehend nor process the meaning intended. To me, this is not a question for a theologian or a musicologist, but rather an anthropologist, psychologist, or even a neuroscientist. 
While I'm none of these types of scientists, I am a practicing music director and worship leader with a healthy academic interest in the issues of worship. And I am willing to attempt to at least begin looking into the answers to this question. There are, in fact, many studies on how the brain processes music and lyrics. We know, for instance, that people with aphasia who cannot speak can still hum a tune. MRIs and brain scans have been done on, in experiments to find these centers of brain activities. One such study was published in the March of 2010 in New Scientist by Jessica Hamzalu, citing work by the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, Germany. We of course also know that many people use familiar tunes to help in the recall of facts and information for tests. The internet is full of study methods using music. We also know that music is used to treat Alzheimer's patients and persons with aut autism. The Alzheimer's Foundation of America lists dozens of ways that music can be used not only to manage emotions, but to even stimulate cognitive function. In fact, the American Music Therapy Association approves over 70 college programs for qualifying licensed music therapists. But while all of this is true, I still wanted to know if I could determine the effectiveness of music to teach theology in congregational worship, which is what it appears we are asking it to do in my own congregation. I decided to examine how well a group of volunteers from my own church cognitively, cognitively process the lyrics of songs that they sing in worship. I took a group of 40 volunteers from the congregation in my church and divided them into three small groups. The test groups were mostly long-term Christians. The average years as a believer was 45 and the average years as regular church attendees was 44. Though all participants were currently members or regular attendees of my United Methodist Church, the denominations in which the bulk of their church experience and therefore the founda their foundation in worship music was formed was varied, including Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Baptist, Assemblies of God, Catholic, and one new Christian with no real Christian background at all. It should also be noted that every participant thought music was a vital, vital part of their worship experience except for one participant who expressed they preferred the sermon above everything else. When asked what music provided for the congregation in worship, 48% of the answers were spiritual in nature, 67% gave a strictly personal reason, and 45% said that congregational participation was an important role for the music. Now yes, that's more than 100%, but everybody could give more than one answer. I decided to use two distinct situations in which music may be encountered in worship, the previously unheard song and the familiar song. For the previously unheard song, I chose a selection from Dr. Ruth's list in order to stay relevant to his study. For the familiar song, <clears throat> I wanted to give the music every possible opportunity to prove its ability to teach theology. So I felt it was appropriate for, um, so I asked every participant to choose their favorite song that they felt was appropriate for use in congregational worship. By letting participants select their own song, any issues of style or familiarity with text or context was taken away. I added the stipulation of appropriate for, uh, of appropriate for congregational worship in order to both gauge what <clears throat> participants thought was appropriate music for congregational worship and to use music whose results from the study could be presumed transferable to other congregation members. The ratio of style and favorite songs selected was 60% to 40% traditional hymns versus contemporary songs. But the, both the qualitative effect and opinions of the songs and the quantitative ability to process the lyrics cognitively would be studied through a series of qualitative and quantitative questions. Both types of questions would lend insight into the effectiveness of lyric to teach theological ideas that could then be expressed in a measurable way. Each group participated in exactly the same series of exercises with the only variable being the personally selected favorite song. All groups were told that what happened in the room was to be strictly withheld and not discussed between groups until all had participated in the exercises. I believe from my contact with the participants during the two weeks it took to move everyone through the study that no one broke this requirement, meaning that every participant participated from the same point of beginning knowledge. The first part of the exercise was dealing with a previously unheard song, a new piece of music. The piece I selected was We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise using both the chorus and both verses. Only one person out of the 40 had ever heard the song before, and this person had never heard the verses. So it met the stipulation of a new song. In order to accurately duplicate how each participant engages with music, uh, with new music in the congregational worship setting, each person selected from their preferred music, uh, 
each person selected their preferred music reading method. The three choices were projected lyrics, in this case the lyrics were written on a whiteboard to simulate uh, this format, a typed lyrics only sheet, or a fully notated piece of music. The group sang the complete piece of music one time while being led vocally by me while I played chords on a guitar. The singing by the group was comparable to what I experienced in a regular congregation on a regular Sunday, and by the second time through the chorus, the singing had become quite sure-footed and well-produced. At the end of the song, I collected the lyric and music sheets and erased the lyrics from the board. I then handed out a series of questions that I asked them to answer from memory. This was to simulate singing a previously unheard song in church and later perhaps discussing that song over a meal or in the car on the way home. Quantitatively, I wanted to see to what degree lyric played in their evaluation of the song, i.e., did they like it? Would they like to see it sung in worship? Did they think it was appropriate for worship? Quantitatively, I asked them questions about meaning and theological focus of the song. So after removing the lyrics, I asked three basic questions. Did you like the song? Why or why not? What was this song about? And which member or members of the Trinity were addressed in the lyrics? The Trinitarian question was used to keep the exercise tied to the Ruth research. In the qualitative judgment question of did you like it, the reasons for their response could be grouped into three categories, strictly personal, lyrical, and strictly musical. So once again, since more than one answer was possible, the percentages reflect this. 79% responded with a strictly personal reason, such as, it made me happy, or it was fun. 58% responded with musical reasons they liked the song, such as, the tune was easy to sing, or I like the beat. Only 30% of responses spoke to a lyrical reference as being a reason to like or not like the song, such as, it had a good message, or reminded me of why we worship. Quantitatively, when asked what the song was specifically about, only 25% of the respondents provided a completely correct answer. 14% were far enough away from the meaning to be deemed completely incorrect, and 61% provided an incomplete answer that was only partially correct. When asked which member, of the member, which member or members of the Trinity was being discussed in the song, 45% provided a correct answer, 39% were completely incorrect, and 16% provided an incomplete or unsure answer. The takeaway from this part of the study is that using a song once even one that is relatively easy to sing as evidenced by the level and quality of participation of the group is insufficient if the objective is to somehow effectively communicate theology. This song was a fairly simple premise and focus along with other clear lyrical meanings. There's very little, little non-literal verbiage. When, complete, correct quantitative, um, when completely correct quantitative answers on only two very simple aspects like general meaning and who is the song talking to, or about, total only 25% and 45% correct, then it appears that to think a lyric can communicate its meaning sufficiently to be classified as actual teaching is suspect. The next part of the exercise revolved around each participant's favorite song for use in congregational worship, which they presented prior to coming, which they pre-selected prior to coming to their group meeting. As mentioned before, these songs represented both the hymn and contemporary genre. My reason for using this approach was that if any theological teaching was to have occurred in worship using music, it seemed reasonable that the best chance to demonstrate this result would be in a song that is cherished by the participant as a favorite. Once again, I asked a series of qualitative questions, seeking to gauge by what criteria a respondent was using for selecting music for congregational participation. I was particularly interested in their impet if their impetus was lyrical or by some other criteria. Quantitatively, I asked them questions modeled after Dr. Ruth's research, specifically using questions about the use of nouns and verbs when speaking about and to God, as well as their ability to determine the member or members of the Trinity being addressed, once again, since this was a focal point of Ruth's research. Finally, I asked them about the overall focus of the song based on whose actions were more abundant in the song, God's or man's. Because this was their self-selected favorite song, and that wasn't, that's important. They chose the song. The key for me was whether people were able to do this from their previous experience with the song, i.e., from memory. So I asked them to answer all of the questions from memory without the benefit of actually seeing the lyric first. I wanted to see how well the lyrics in the songs they said they loved 
were able to be recalled and used in a way that could reasonably shown at reasonably reasonably be shown as functional theological knowledge. I encourage them to spend a few minutes singing the song to themselves in order to stimulate their memory. After completing the first pass through the questions referring to the lyrics from memory, I then provided every participant with a printed copy of the lyrics to their selected song. I asked them to answer the quantitative questions again using the printed lyrics as a reference. I wanted to see if their ability to determine the theological content of the song improved by seeing the lyric and being able to answer the questions essentially with the answers in front of them. Before grading the qualitative answers, I determined to use any reference to lyrical content, including specific lyrics, all the way to general spiritual comments, as a lyrical or specifically theological answer. Anything having to do with melody, tune, emotion, or personal recollection or sentiment would be considered not specifically theological content. Before grading the qualitative answers, I analyzed every song using so every song they selected using the same criteria as Ruth's study, and then compared the participants' answers to my analysis. I was then able, to, then able to divide their answers into one of three categories, correct, incorrect, or incomplete. For those doing the math with me, some percentages that add up to over 100% are because more than one answer was possible on some questions, especially the qualitative questions. Percentages that add up to less than 100% are due to people not answering the question at all and thus contributing to a no answer percentage. In the initial, uh, in the initial from memory section, the participants were first asked two qualitative questions regarding their chosen song. The first question asked why the participants selected the song as their favorite. 82% gave an answer that could be qualified as strictly personal that had nothing to do with lyrical or theological content. Only 36% included a lyrical reason that was either their sole reason or was combined with their personal reason. When asked why the song was appropriate for congregational worship, however, 61% included a lyrical reason or theological reason by the criteria outlined above for their selection, thereby doubling the previous percentage of lyrical theological references. This appears to indicate that while most participants selected a personal favorite for personal reasons, which is not surprising, a majority considered lyrical content or theological content as the more valid reason for inclusion in worship. Next, the participants were asked a series of quantitative questions about the lyric of their favorite song. And remember, these participants could have selected any song in the entire Christian lexicon, and even non-Christian lexicon, if they considered it appropriate for congregational worship. When asked what the song was specifically about, 21% were able to provide a completely correct answer. 9% had no portion correct, and 62% were able to provide only a partially correct answer. When asked what member or members of the Trinity were being addressed, 29% were completely correct. 35% were completely incorrect, and 26% were, were partially correct. When asked what specific nouns or names of members of the Trinity were used in the song to address the various members of the Trinity, 26% were completely correct, 18% were completely incorrect, and 44% were partially correct. When asked what actions of God or verbs directly related to God and God's actions were used, 9% were completely correct, 15% were incorrect, and 56% were only partially correct. Finally, when asked who was featured more prominently in the song, or in other words, whose actions the song focused on most, God or man, 53% were able to distinguish correctly, while 29% were completely incorrect. While these results are telling based on the ability to analyze text from memory, I believed this had to be balanced by assessing their baseline ability to do so with the text in front of them. So I handed out the text of their favorite song to each person and asked the, qualitative, the quantitative questions again. This time, each person would have the benefit of being able to look at the text as they answered the same question. Basically, they had the answers in front of them. When asked what the song was about, specifically, with the words in front of them, the correct answers rose by 11%, while the incomplete answers shrank by 15%. However, the completely incorrect answers rose by 9%. When asked what member or members of the Trinity were being addressed in the song, 
correct answers rose by 18%, while incomplete answers dropped by only 2%, and incorrect answers dropped by 11%. When asked about names used to address the members of the Trinity, the correct answers rose by 30%, while incomplete answers dropped by 9%, and incorrect answers dropped by 18%. When asked about the actions of God, correct answers rose by 29%, incomplete answers dropped by 24%, and incorrect answers stayed the same. Lastly, when asked to differentiate between human action and God action in the song, correct answers stayed the same, while incorrect answers rose by 15%. So what does all of this mean? The results appear to indicate that we do not process lyrics in a strictly comprehensive cognitive fashion. In fact, our ability to produce cognitive results based on lyrical content is inaccurate at best. Even when given the words for visual analysis, the percentage of correct answers did not rise significantly, and in fact on two questions the percentage of incorrect answers rose. In the comparison between memory and having the lyric in front of the participant, it appears that statistically we are able to process nouns and proper nouns and verbs fairly well when we have the lyrics in front of us. Incidences of incorrect assignment of focus for nouns and verbs, especially for nouns, was more prevalent in songs containing, uh, sorry, was more prevalent in songs containing inadequately, inadequately specified pronouns, such as you, which were often tied to more than one person of the Trinity, thereby making it difficult to determine the lyrical focus. Confidence only rose when the lyrics were in front of the participants, uh, sorry, confidence also rose when the lyrics were in front of the participants indicated by the reduction of skipped answers. For the worship leader choosing music based on lyrical content, this seems to suggest that many of the topical and theological ties we rely on to justify our selections in congregational worship are lost on the singers. Furthermore, the qualitative data suggests that there are many reasons songs connect with congregation members in worship and lyrical content is not the top factor. This begs leaders to re-examine the reason for song choice in worship. If songs are being selected with the intention to instruct, they appear to be failing to meet that objective, at least in a complete sense. If the participants in this exercise were unable to answer questions on basic facts, then how much more is it asking to process of the listener and participant to process and understand more complex theological ideology without extra intensive study? The feedback from this exercise suggests that music selected for musical and worship context reasons, such as an upbeat song to express joy, is much more meaningful than the actual lyrics themselves. On the other hand, the majority of the songs chosen by the participants as their favorites contain both deep and broad theological content. Most contain references to more than one person of the Trinity. Many of them relate a variety of verbs and adjectives describing God's actions and traits. In essence, these were not all shallow songs with little theological content. Many of the selected songs were also popular, at least by the standard of how I often ask how, I, how often I am asked to program them in worship. Could therefore one conclude that though unable to cognitively produce quantitative answers about the lyrical content of their chosen song, Still, somehow, quality lyrical content makes a deep impression on the participant. We can assume that music derives, drives the lyrics deep into our subconscious, as exhibited by the fact that Alzheimer's patients, deep in their dementia, are still able to sing the lyrics and melodies of songs from their memories. Does this mean that intentional care and lyrical selection, though not necessarily apparent in this exercise, can still make a long-term impression on the theological knowledge of the average congregation member. Ultimately, I find the results of this exercise inconclusive as it pertains to the need for a major shift in thinking about worship planning in relation to song selection for worship. While I agree with the importance of studies such as Dr. Ruth's and Dr. Hong's, as well as the plethora of other studies and opinions and writings on this topic that, we, that have been generated, I have to wonder if we're missing the forest as we study the trees. What I did find interesting was that at the end of the sessions, nearly every participant expressed that they would never again fail to only casually consider lyrics in worship. Each person was amazed, and some were dismayed,
by how little they knew about the lyrical content of their favorite worship song. Most expressed a desire to be more intentional about exploring the meaning of the text that they sing in the future. Because of this possibility of increased awareness, it continues to be important uh, to remain diligent in our selection of lyrical content. Perhaps that is the takeaway for leaders. Choose lyrics carefully and with intentionality, but be sure to make others aware of the reasons for your choice and raise awareness of what is being sung in congregational settings. This allows the congregation to make a choice about the level of their involvement in the lyrics. My own lyrically focused song selection will not change based on this exercise. What will change is how I approach introducing music to my congregation, as well as following up with secondary instruction in an attempt to bring the lyrical content into focus for my congregation. While I know that academically we must continue to ask questions of our music and should ask questions of our music that we use in worship, I believe that we must also remember the forgotten member of this relationship between music, theology, and worship, the congregational participant. We should be looking to see if what we believe to be true and important about music and worship is actually reaching the intended beneficiary. Yes, God is our focus, but the congregation member is both the active participant and the receiver when it comes to theology and music not just the academic or the informed leader of worship. Thank you.